All right, good afternoon. Let's continue where we left off. Um, we were discussing about uh, hydrogen bonds, different kinds from strong, very strong, strong to weak interactions. Where we saw that, although this is very highly directional, uh, we are expecting um, the angle to be linear, close to 180 degrees. In reality, we see less than 180. It's because of various other packing effects. You know, when you have interactions present, they try to bend a little bit. But the rule of thumb is, as long as they have, you know, the um, non-hydrogen uh, atom distance is less than a sum of the Van der Waals radii, then we can assume that there is a strong interaction present and the presence of a hydrogen bond. Like this, we have got many, um, you know, interactions, hydrogen bonded interactions that involves different types of heteroatoms from nitrogen, oxygen, and CHO, CHN, OH5, NH5, CH5. All these things are, that are present. I'm not going to discuss, as I mentioned, so you will see um, uh, in, in, the, in the literature, <clears throat> in terms of reviews, even books, for example, CH5 interaction, there's a small book available. Um, let's see. Okay, you have the control. Yeah, now you so, can control. All right. Um, I, you know, I mean, indeed, in experimentally, you can also see um, just a perfectly linear um, hydrogen bonds here. The NHO the hydrogen bonds as shown in here. So this is one day exception. Okay. I mean, you don't see you know very linear hydrogen bonds where you have got one donor, uh, you know, this is a donor hydrogen, this is acceptor, donor hydrogen, only one is present, you know, one donor, one acceptor that lead to the linear tape type of thing in the case of um, you know this uh, amide um, compound. Um, you will also see very strong hydrogen bonds in the case of triphenyl oxide. Um, you know, this is a very good acceptor. So with phenol, it forms very strong hydrogen bonds. Um, in fact, in fact uh, the distance is uh, been going to be exceptionally small. Okay. So what will happen instead of having one donor on one acceptor? If you have one donor, if, if you have more donors or more acceptors, you have a different scenario. In this case, you know, a, a, a different type of hydrogen bond that is given here. In this particular compound, this is urea, or it can be thiourea, I think. In the case of urea, this is urea. Thiourea also forms a similar one. So it has got two NH. This NH or hydrogen bonded to the O, you know, so it forms what is called a bifurcated hydrogen bond or three centered interaction. This is because, you know, it has got more donors than the number of acceptors. Because of that, they want to utilize the maximum. They started forming bifurcated <clears throat> hydrogen bonds or three centered. Like that, you can also have trifurcated, that means four centered bond. That is also possible. And, and um, you have uh, four electron negative atoms to, you know, bonded three, you know, non covalently bonded also. You know, you can have a different types of types of uh, uh, hydrogen, hydrogen bonds that are possible. In this case, okay, you've got what will happen uh, in the case of uh, having more acceptors like nitrogen atoms or oxygen, carbonyl oxygen. Uh, that happens in most of the organic compounds. That's what that's what happened. In, in fact, when you have something like that, um, uh, then you will have you will have more uh, acceptors, but uh, you don't have many donors. So it will look for all these nitrogen or carbonyl oxygen. They will look for acceptors. When you try to crystallize, they ended up taking water. In water, you have got two of you know hydrogens and one oxygen. So you ended up having 
hydrates just because of that particular form compound. So except that rich molecules usually crystallize as hydrates. Um, yeah, I, I just put it in here, phenyl embrace here, because there's another type of very weak interaction that is very similar to, you know, better than Van der Waals, you know, phenyl phenyl interaction. If you are interested, you can take a look at it in the literature by Ian Dance. Um, um, so there are there are many examples. I'm not going to give you. Maybe I'll in the assignment I'm going to ask you to ask you to find out, uh, you know, trifurcated hydrogen bonds having. Uh, you know, more number of donors or more number of acceptors. I don't know what, what's happening here. Sorry, next. No problem. Um, the hydrogen bonds tend to form complementarity, cooperative effects. I don't know whether you are aware of it. They, they try to repeat, you know, I mean, the, the, you know, one example is shown here, then you will understand is a hydroquinone compound. Hydroquinone is, uh, you know, OH here, this OH on both sides. So it forms, you know, the oxygen is a donor and the hydrogen, uh, no, ox hydrogen is a donor and the oxygen is an acceptor. So it repeats here very nicely, okay? So on both sides, you form, you know, it forms um, hydrogen bonded, the extended hydrogen bonded stage type of uh, structure as shown here. And uh, as you see here, there's a 2-1 screw axis. I'm not sure whether you are familiar with this crystallographically. There's a 2-1 is very similar to, you know, helical uh, type of thing. I'm not going to uh, go into the details of it because you need to rotate and then, and then you have to move it up by half of the unit. So that's the meaning of 2-1 screw axis. And uh, this type of hydrogen bonds usually can form a dimer, trimer, tetramer, when it forms a dimer, something like this, OH was from alcohols, you know, ROH, you know, this OH4 kind of hydrogen bond, this, the one in red color, will be more acidic. You know why? Because, you know, this, this one is also shared between uh, the two hydrogens. So this will, the electron, you know, uh, density will be pulled towards this side because of that, this will be more acidic. So this type of dimer, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a normal thing that you observe. You don't, you don't have usually monomer, which is if, if you have a monomer in the crystal structure without any hydrogen bonds, that's because of, because of the steric hindrance or something. So your, your, your mon a dimer will be easier to form than monomer. They tend to form dimer. It, likewise, a trimer will form uh, easier than the dimer. Okay, when there's a chance, it will try to form a trimer something like or tetramer. So usually the alcohol, you know, you can see all kinds of all kinds of uh, uh, you know association forming dimer, trimer, tetramer, uh, all these things that we see. That's just because the interactions will lead to minimization of uh, potential energy that will lead to the stability of uh, the crystal. Sir, I think the big is not connected. Is this here? Yeah. No, this is here. Okay. There you go. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, let's talk about weak hydrogen bonds. When, when you have X equal to carbon, it's a low electronegative, uh, you know, instead of oxygen or hydrogen, and YZ, where Y can be you know, C double bond C or C triple bond C, you know, polyphenic or um, acetyl uh, type of uh, aromatic thing or aromatic. So, you can expect very weak one because CH, you know, I mean, you can't, it, it's not a good donor, but still you can, it can form uh, a weak hydrogen bond and also CHO interactions. That's another thing. So this kind of weak in, in, uh, hydrogen bonds are, um, are, are quite familiar, you know, observed in, in the literature. Um, when you have CHO interactions or any weak hydrogen bonded interaction as shown here, they can be compressed or expanded, bent or straightened by crystal packing forces because these interactions will be there. It has got lower energy. When you have higher energy hydrogen bonds or other forces, it can bend very easily. 
or you can straighten also where you don't have expect CH2 interactions to be to, uh, to be linear. You can also see that kind of thing. Um, and also it's less discernible, very difficult to find out, you know, this uh, uh, water associated in the in the uh, characteristics of this type of double bonds. The other a very important thing which I put it inside this uh, uh, box is the weaker acidic CH donor form, long hydrogen bonds whose length may exceed the van der Waals separation distance. Previously, I mentioned the rule of thumb to find out uh, the bonding um, between, between the groups is to look for the distance. If the distance is less than the sum of the van der Waals radii, then you have a bonding present. The CH2 interaction is an exception. What happened with CH and other donors, you will see the distance more than the sum of the van der Waals radii. This is something controversial in the literature for some time, because people say that even when you have CHO compound, CO distance is 3.5 to 4, they still say that this is, there is a bond. It's a big controversy for, for about 20 to 50 to 20 years, and then a lot of computational calculations and everything. They have shown that they are also significant. They are present, which I don't understand anyway. Because usually, they, if there is an interaction, the distance should be less than the sum of the van der Waals radii. But in this case, CHO is an exception. Even if it is, even if it is more than the sum of the van der Waals radii, these distances are all long-range distances are all still there. They are significant. They, they contribute to the stabilization of the crystal structures. Okay, this is something, something uh, unique and different from what you normally uh, hear. You know, this CHO interaction is, is an exception. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> um, then I, I'm going to talk about some exceptions and some examples of. of uh, CHO interactions, um, where it is predominant in the crystal structure. Um, this is hydro, yeah, of course, this is quinone. Uh, take a look at the crystal structure, how this quinone is associated through CHO hydrogen bonds. This is quinone oxygen, oxygen. So you can see that they are nicely hydrogen bonded, complementarily hydrogen bonded to form a sheet like structure. Because of that, you see, this is an organic compound. So you don't expect the melting point of benzoquinone is very high, 108 for, for its structure. That's because of, you know, this compound is stabilized by weak CHO interaction, and that contributes to high melting point of benzoquinone. So whenever you have weak interactions, and if they are present in plenty, they contribute to the Okay, you know, uh, to the stability of the compound. Um, but I, I just talked about OH interaction, alcohol interaction. They tend to form dimer. They tend to form trimer. This particular example is an exception because OH is kind of isolated because of the steady hindrance, because of the presence of two phenyl ring uh, in the ortho positions. Because of that, this OH cannot form dimer or even trimer. Maybe phenol may form, but not this. <clears throat> they ended up uh, in forming uh, OH pi. Uh, th this is uh, OH, this is by OH pi interaction. So you can confine uh, to observe certain type of, certain type of uh, unusual interactions in the crystal structure by design. Okay. This is a OH. And you can also observe CH pi interactions. Uh, when you when you change this one to um, uh, CH3, for example, methyl group, so you'll see immediately C, you know, CH, CH pi interaction. So usually the CH pi interaction are weaker than OH pi interaction, which in turn weaker than CHO. So that CHO is stronger than OH pi, that is, you know, CH pi is very, very strong. So these kind of Supramolecular interactions are also present. They, they are also very important in, in the in crystal engineering of, of, of solids. Um, yeah, okay. I think I, I defeated here 
the properties of CHO bonds here. This is this has got electrostatic character with a long range distance fall off. All the hydrogen bonded uh, hydrogen bonds have this electrostatic character. The length of CHO bond depends on both the acidity of the CH group and the basicity of the oxygen atom. It depends on uh, what you have in the crystal structure. A typical um, uh, this you know angle is about 100 to 180. 180 is very rare. And if they cluster around 150 to 160, they are weak, can be distorted by any force in the crystal, in the crystal structure. If you have some other interaction is present, it can easily be distorted. But weak hydrogen bonds are important in crystal engineering. Okay, so far we talked about relatively directional, stronger interaction. <clears throat> Now we are going to talk about different types of interactions, which you might have heard. I'm not very sure. Halogen, um, halogen interaction. Halogen in general, it's called halogen bonds, like hydrogen bonds, halogen bonds. Okay, what is halogen bonds? Let's take a look at the um, electron distribution um, in these compounds: CF4, CF3Cl, CF3Br, CF3I. The blue color shows the electron, the distribution of electrons in the on, on fluorine atom, okay? They're all highly symmetrical, okay? You can see that more electrons are distributed along uh, the equatorial part of this, if you just draw a line here. Then you have Cl, Cl being, you know, uh, bigger size, bigger in size. <clears throat> Again, you know, as compared to fluorine has got less electrons, Electronegativity because the electrons will be uh, pulled, you know, away from this fluorine. In the case of bromine, you started seeing uh, electron electrons around this, and also red color shows the electron positive, you know, uh, residual uh, delta plus here. In the case of CF3I, more delta plus, you know, along this side more delta minus electrons are distributed electropositive here. See? When you have iodine. When you have similar such thing, you know, when you have CF3I, if you bring another CF3I, what happened? It forms halogen bond. Because in this side, you know, I mean, from uh, this direction is positive, this direction is negative. So it can form a bent bond because of the electrostatic interaction. So we call this as halogen bond. But if you take a look at the crystal structures, this is called type two halogen bond. But if you take a look at the um, crystal structures of many things, in a half of the time, you have got this type of geometry, you know, where they see X is any halogen and at an angle, not, you know, uh, normal, perpendicular, something like this to explain the normal halogen bond. So when you have something like this, um, they were mistaken as halogen bond before, but this is due to um, symmetry, crystal symmetry or pseudo symmetry that dictates the electrostatically identical regions of the adjacent halogen items to make closer structure. It so happened, the packing forces this one to be there like this. Although there is no real halogen bond present in some of the compounds, but you would, you would see that this is true halogen bond, this is not. This is based on experimental evidences, based on computational calculations, and recently, about 10 years ago, they defined what is meant by halogen bond that becomes very, very important in crystal engineering. Actually, they started using this directional uh, electrostatic force to form different types of uh, topological um, uh, topologically important uh, organic compounds that shows very interesting properties. Two people who have contributed to this is, uh, you know, uh, Rezonati and Metrangelo, you know, from Italy. They have done lots of work. If you look at some of his, some of their works, they are always published in uh, Nature Chemistry and Nature Science or Angiology kind of thing in the past 20 years. Um, so halogen bonds are important. 
And even if you have iodine nitrogen, nitrogen is not halogen, mind you. Um, iodine oxygen, bromine oxygen, all these things. Yes, all these things are also called, you know, even sulfur, sulfur, halogen bonds. You know. Okay, halogen bonds are commonly, you know, known even between, you know, if, if the interaction between bromine and oxygen, sulfur and nitrogen, all these things. Okay. Sir. So for example, sir, I just one small query. Yes. Sir, this type one is not halogen bond. Type two is halogen bond. Yes, type two is halogen bond. You can explain based on yes. this. Yes. But in when we see this crystal structure, most of the cases we found this type one. You say that is type one halogen bond, but it's not halogen bond. But you can usually people start writing, okay, this is type one. Type one, you know, there's no uh, experimental or computational support. Maybe after 10 years, if you guys come up with certain things that, yes, we do have, based on some other reason, there is a way to do that. But obviously, it is due to some kind of packing. Pseudosymmetry dictates the formation. They push everything together. Okay, still we don't know how to explain. Okay. So, so if someone asked, this is... Type real one, you say type one halogen bond. That's it. Halogen, no. There is no without any backup. Yeah, this is normally observed. But type two is a real one. We know that it is the interaction is present, electrostatic interaction is present because they have done some calculations to show that it is real. Electrostatic interaction attraction is real. Okay, so this is the one very popular, probably you know, diapsin and bromine. Um, you know, this forms a colored compound, molecular complex, and the bromine oxygen interaction again, exactly based on. This one, but it was done about 1954. He got Nobel Prize, you know, for some other work. But you know, he published this this particular one on oxygen, uh, on uh, I mean, well, dioxin uh, bromine bond. This one. So in addition to it, you have got mantle pi. You know, you know, all these are very weak interactions. But in this case, halogen is directional. In this case, but we have metal pi interactions, metallophilic interactions that probably you might have heard of. If you are working in with the organ, you know, inorganic compounds, metal metals, this aerophilic interaction is very popular. People have used Schmidt Bauer, for example, from Germany, has done lots of work. This is a very common uh, to observe this uh, gold gold interaction that will give rise to emission, very interesting emission properties. People see that in the in nanocrystals also. Even, for example, silver silver, you know, argentophilic interaction, but but it's weaker, but you know, gold gold interaction in the case of gold one compounds, gold one compounds is predominant. Predominant. You, you know, it's very rare not to see gold gold interaction, but people use that to. Uh, we will come back to this interaction in our in our uh, lecture, maybe maybe later. Gold gold, even uh, cuprophilic interactions, or uh, people have done, but it's very weak. Uh, but it has been observed that it is present. These are all uh, weak interaction or non-covalent interaction. The weak interaction contributing to the stability of uh, the crystals, crystal engineering. Sometimes we can use it. Uh, I mean, especially, you know, Paul, uh, halogen bonds have been successfully used to make different types of uh, compounds, topologies. And gold-gold interaction is very, very common. And uh, you cannot avoid it. Always it forms. So, and also it, it gives rise to high emission. If it doesn't show any emission, that means it is it is there's no gold gold interaction present for some reason. OK, now. Um, I, I would like to actually go into the details of every type of interaction and talk about it since since this is only five day uh, 15 hour uh, lecture. I don't have time to go through all the all types of uh, weak interactions. But you see how you can measure them, how, how you can determine experimentally what are the ways to find out that this kind of interactions are present. Methods to study these interaction. Of all the things, one is crystallography. In crystallography, it will tell you, uh, you know, where the atoms are present. But you need to remember, X-ray crystallography, um, you know, we can get only the electron density. We don't see the atom. We don't know which atom is which. Is which. It's only the electron density. If you are a chemical crystallographer, you should be able to identify, oh, this is gold, this is platinum, based on the number of electrons. 
otherwise otherwise it won't tell you that this is uh, you know silver and this is gold no no way um so this is an important experimental technique in the determination of crystal structure you can one can use not only x-ray crystallography which is very common and cheaper accessible to most of the people you can also use neutron crystallography where you have uh, neutrons you know you, you don't have access in many places unless unless you have got um, uh, nuclear you know, uh, fusion uh, other nuclear reactors uh, that, that produces this kind of neutrons of course electron diffraction electron diffraction not only electron diffraction you can also use the uh, uh, electron microscopy to determine uh, the structures nowadays of course apart from crystallography one can use the crystallographic databases there are different types of databases like like uh, csd uh, uh, cambridge crystal database and uh, powder diffraction database but also for protein they have their own uh, this Cambridge structural database is very useful. I don't know whether you have it here. You have. Okay, good. So what you need to do, if you make a new compound, you need to make sure that your compound is new. You know, I mean, first of all, you need to find out your compound is new and then crystal structure is new. Okay, it, it just started in being reported. You want to make sure. And then, you know, you, you can follow the trends of packing, examining the number of molecules in the you know, asymmetric unit. It's called Z prime. Um, I, I don't want to talk about it. It's a, it's a special type of thing. You know, I mean, usually you expect uh, P1 bar means Z equal to two or one. If it is three, if it is four, then you need to go for you know, this uh, crystallographic database and see why you have more number of molecules in the, in the uh, unit cell. Um, polymorphism, you know, whether you may have you may have a you know a new crystal structure, but a, a different form may be reported before a different polymorphic modification. Um, and also, you can use this, uh, you know, to, to as a knowledge bank for crystal structure prediction. Uh, how you can use it for prediction of crystal structures. So let me spend a couple of uh, uh, slides and a few minutes to explain uh, the Cambridge crystal. Uh, crystallographic database is more than 50 years old since uh, 1972. Uh, they started uh, collecting collecting um, all the SIF files. SIF, SIF means um, crystallographic information file, which you can uh, you uh, see them using text file. Maybe next week I'll talk about it. Those who are doing research and they want to know more about it, especially from the reference point of view and some problems, like I will explain. Uh, or I'll discuss about it next week. Uh, this Mercury is a software. This particular one, <clears throat> I mean, really is, is the, actually is available in most of the places. But Mercury is the free software you can download and for visualization of uh, the crystal structures. This will be very useful, you know, to see how the molecules are packed, and you can you can see different types of interactions that are present in. Uh, in the in the packing using this visual, visualization software. As you see <clears throat> from this graph, um, we crossed more than one million structures a few years ago. This is million structure. I think this one million structure. Um, this has got more polymorphic drug modification. Okay, I'll talk, talk about it this step. So you see 1.25. And we get lots of information, lots of information. <clears throat> for example, for all the for all the um, uh, structures reported, especially <clears throat> this deals. Uh, I forgot to say that this particular database, you know, has got information about the crystal structures for the molecules having at least one carbon atom. If it doesn't have a carbon atom, ammonium nitrate, you can't find it. The sodium chloride, you can't find it. You need to go to inorganic structural database. For that, it's not. So it has to have at least acetate, you know, so no problem at all, or urea kind of thing. Um, okay, so you also see a lot of very interesting, interesting things. When you have a crystal structure, you'll find out of all the 1.25, 1.25, 1.25, 1.25, 1.25, 1.25, 1.25, 1.25, 1.25, 1.25, 1.25, 1.25, 1.25, 1.25, 1.25, 1.25, 1.
on by two, you know, this many number, 1.25 million structures, 34% of them belong to P2104C. You have a particular way of packing it. Okay, P2104C. 25% <clears throat> P1 bar. These are all very common space groups. It's a symbol that describes the packing nature. Okay, how the crystals um, of molecules can pack. It's a symbol. P21 is a sub, you know, it's missing. Okay. So if you if you see that, only one, two, three, four, five, five uh, space groups are very popular. You know, I mean, most of the complex crystallize may at least 5% or more. You know, the rest of them are insignificant. But if you look at the number, you know, out of uh, 1.25 million, it's a lot. Actually, even if it's 0.3 times, it's a lot, but percentage wise, um, you know, the T2 one point C is the most most popular um, compound. So if you take a compound and crystallize, most likely it's going to crystallize in P2 one point C or P2 one point, you know, or P1 point. And the additional one, which I didn't, didn't give it to you, this will also give you, you know, if you're a crystallographer, you know, it will tell you who got how many structures, you know, I mean, this author's statistics also, it will give you number of authors, you know, with uh, more than 500 structures, you know, from 2004, it's only 113, 223,000 people. And also who got more number of, you know, paper, you know, uh, more number of crystal structures, rain gold. Okay, and as uh, you see here, I'm surprised to see even my name after a few years of after my retirement. So see here, I'm still there. So this kind of information, you can, you can get it. Apart from this, this is more important. This kind of thing, if you want to, if you want to uh, analyze some of the some of the interactions using the database, this would be very useful. What is called scatter plots? What is meant by scatter plots? Take a look at this. This shows strong hydrogen bonds, OHO bonds. You can isolate. You can write. You know, I mean, it's very easy to retrieve that one using the database. This shows. How many data points are there for the strong OHO hydrogen bonds that plots angle versus distance? Okay, this distance is OHO distance. Okay, this H2O distance. You see, most of the compounds, they you know they reside here. That means the angle is about more than 160 to 180. The distance is 1.6 to 2.0. This is highly directional. You see, very strong. OHO is very strong. But you also see some scattered plots. You also see some points here. How can you have distance? How can you have angle 120, even 110, 100? Uh, and uh, hydrogen to oxygen distance, you call it here. The distance is more than 2.8. So you can go back and check each and every entry and see what is the reason. Is it is it is it because of the static hindrance? They are they are really trapped in somewhere. They are not able to uh, make a you know strong bond, or is it because of uh, you know the crystallographer's fault of assigning wrong uh, atom? You know, I mean, there may be mistakes also. So, but mostly ignoring this, you can see that. This scatter plot will help you in determining what could be the uh, angle and uh, voyage over distance. Okay, mostly here. The next plot, scatter plot, is a CHO interaction. As you see, CHO interaction is very weak. If it is very weak, the distance, CHO distance, you know, H to oxygen distance will be more, see from 2.8, 2.4, even 2.2 to 3. They're all in here. And the angle varies right from 180, 180, we don't see anything. And 170, you know, 120 to 170. So this will help you to have some kind of idea about what kind of interaction, how this, this will be helpful. Most of them are very weak. You know, it's very difficult to predict CHO, but they're all present there. You can retrieve all these things in, in the CSD Cambridge Structural Database using different types of software that are present. Okay, 
And also you can use the AR spectroscopy, vibration spectroscopy. I, I don't want to go into the details, you know, voice stretching. And then because of hydrogen bonds, it can even be shifted. All kinds of things you can do. You can use, even use NMR for that matter. Uh, but in solution, you know, it's not solid state. The solid state, you know, you can do it too. Um, computational methods, one can use it for predicting the structures, you know, computational methods, DFT. These are these these are some of the uh, software that are available. I haven't updated uh, quite for quite some time. So uh, there are there are different ways of uh, you know there are different software you can use this one to predict the crystal structure. But most most of the time this is only 50 50 percent chance of predicting the right one, right one. But still it is evolving. Maybe in another twenty years this will become a standard, and then one can predict the crystal structures. By writing the chemical chemical structure of the carbon, so we'll find out the crystal structure. Um, there is a competition, you know, that started in 1999. <clears throat> it's called crystal structure prediction blind test. You know, this uh, Cambridge data, uh, Cambridge Crystallographic Data Center, will send out email to all the crystallographers and computational people, say that okay, determine the crystal structure of this particular compound. You are not supposed to. Uh, crystallize it and then determine the crystal structure. You have to predict. They have done it because now, you know, this is the sixth blind test that was conducted uh, in 2000. I don't know. Yeah, when, when was it? It was 2016. <clears throat> there may be one now. I'm not following this. <clears throat> so, uh, just to encourage people to work on this area, mainly to work on these areas. So maybe in the future, you know, when more and more. Uh, information is available, uh, better software is available, one may be able to predict the crystal structures right from uh, the structure of the compound. Return. Okay. So these are the points to keep in mind. Um, intermolecular interactions, um, and again, see, I'm using a different number, it's not the same. Uh, it's 0.5 to 20 kilocals. And these are all supramolecular glues. Okay, you have to remember, you know, you know the post-it uh, by 3M. You know, you just stick it on, just a small uh, yellow colored post-it. You know, you put it on dry is sticking. It doesn't stick well. This is just like all supramolecular interaction. But it's useful. You know, you can take it out. The same thing here. And whereas super glue will stick once it, you stick the covalent bonds. You know, that's that's how I relate to that. That's why they put supramolecular glue. Okay, that binds, but is not very, very uh, strong. Um, so, a crystal structure is a result of um, uh, compromise between several weak interactions. Okay, M many of the crystal structures we we, we expect certain uh, interactions to be present. It's because of uh, the way it's packed. You don't see them, or you see them uh, surprisingly. You know, or or with a distorted, highly distorted, weak, you know, weak interaction. So usually strong directionality and distance fall off are three characteristics of properties of intermolecular interaction. So this is very important for designing any, any crystal structures. Okay, strong and directional interactions are useful. And the hydrogen bonds are important. They are directional. They have contribution to electrostatic polarization and charge transfer. Higher hierarchy in crystal. So the you know, take home message is of all the interactions that we have seen, hydrogen bond are important in designing uh, the, the organic crystals, such as molecular crystals. Okay, then we'll take another 10 minutes um, to explain the graph set notation. Usually, what happens when you have a crystal structure? Um, the packing, the symmetry, you try to come up with a symbol, phase group symbol to describe the symmetry. Uh, same thing happens in all, you know, we all have formula or symbol to describe certain things. This is what it is. Graph set notation is nothing but um, to simplify, to describe the type of hydrogen bonds that are present in various structures. Okay. Is it's used to describe hydrogen bonding pattern. It's a formula we try to, you know, symbol. We try to describe it in terms of symbol 
once you derive the symbol, that will tell you what kind of hydrogen bonding pattern is there. The understanding and characterization of hydrogen bonds is very important to understand the effect on crystal structures. Okay, for all these things, graph, graph set notation is to simplify the uh, process. And this was created by Eggy, uh, Peggy Etter. And then there are a few other guys who took it over, but you know, they're not, you know, they're, more, they're no more um, alive. So Bernstein is the other one. And it's actually, the literature is very old. Um, how do you describe it? Symbol is given here, just like space group. Okay, there's a way to describe the hydrogen bonding pattern. If it is a chain, is a chain of hydrogen bonds, a straight, you know, aggregate. So you call it C. If it is a ring, you call it R. If it's an intramolecular hydrogen bond, you know, cell. Yes, but finite only, you know, dimer, discrete, you know, dimer, trimer. So you say D. So graphs of notation is given like G, A, B, N. So G, you describe this is a chain, a ring, intramolecular hydrogen bond, intramolecular or, you know, finite pattern. A is the number of, A, the superscript, gives the number of hydrogen acceptors. A okay, for acceptor, remember. B for donor, number of hydrogen bond donors. And N gives the number of atoms in the atom. Okay. For example, use this diamond. Okay. R. Why there is an R? Because it's ring. It's a ring. So R. This two subscript, superscript, uh, is the number of acceptor. How many acceptors are there? Acceptor is one, two. So two. How many donors? Two. Eight is the number of atoms in the ring. From here, one. Now, so start from here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight. So if you say that this hydrogen bond pattern belongs to, you know, it can be defined as R228. Okay, this, that's a way to describe, uh, the, you know, this is called a graph set notation. And describe it. Uh, yeah, I mean, for example, C4. C is chain. Okay, this is a chain. Four is the number of atoms in the chain. So repeating unit. One, two, three, four. Repeating. C4. This is discrete. Okay, D. There's nothing. It's only between two atoms, so it's fine. This is self intramolecular. So six. Number of atoms in the in the uh, loop. Six, and this we have seen all to here. Simple, how to describe different types of hydrogen bond pattern, but it becomes more and more complicated as um, as you have as you have more number of hydrogen bonds are there. So this is easier to describe. This is easier to describe when you have different types of things. Okay, this we describe for this. In addition to it, we have got one more type of hydrogen bonds. So we have to combine all these things. So it becomes more and more complicated, but don't worry about it. So there is a way to describe the graphs of notation. And some examples are here. I don't want to go through this. You can go through this and find out whether it makes sense because answer is also given. If you have any problem, come and discuss with me. We can discuss during the tutorial. Um, yeah, take a look at this um, why these pictures, different different um, hydrogen bonding pattern. They all belong to R228. They all, but take a look at the substituents here. They're all different. Although different compounds, okay, this is acid, okay, carboxylic acid. This is the amide, this is phosphate, this is the amide and uh, different types, this is periodyl group. You see, in all these things, various groups are involved in formation of the dimer, but still they have the same motif. So it's called isographic, isographic, um, you know, motif. Okay. So I think with that, um, I will finish this chapter. 
Okay, you can, you can stop it and go to the next slide. The fifth one. So I think in this in this portion of uh, uh, the lecture, I have covered, I think all, um, you know, uh, different types of supramolecular interactions that are available for us in the uh, crystal engineering toolbox. Okay. Now, how we are going to use it for making different designs, you know, um, they, you know, or, or how to design different types of motifs uh, in the in the case of organic crystal. This is what we are going to see in the next lecture. Did you did you send the um, the mm -hmm. coordination to other? Latest one. The latest one. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, later in the Okay. So now we have got various kinds of interactions. Now we are going to use it, especially hydrogen bonded interactions, to to form to design different type of topologies. That's what we are going to. Whether it is possible to design, that's another thing. Okay. <clears throat> and this is an attempt anyway. Our crystal design uh, strategies. These are the things that I will be, I will be covering um, under this topic. Okay, now I want to talk about organic. I'm not an organic chemist. Okay, anyway. Um, Bola was the first one to synthesize an organic compound in the lab. Probably you know. By taking an inorganic compound. <laughs> anyway, it's ammonium, um, uh, what is it, uh, cyanate. It's not cyanide, by heating it, it forms urea. This is the first time an organic molecule was synthesized ever. Right? But you will see later. Look at the look at the time. It's 1800, no, 1880, 1828. See, the first MOF was synthesized in 1700. Okay, MOF before long before all these all these things. Anyway, I'm going, I'm coming to the, that one maybe next class. Okay, after this, you know, Bill Starter, actually this guy has done a lot of, lot of synthesis. He's the first time he has done, um, you know, the synthesis, the multi-step synthesis, okay? Um, propionone, not that complicated, right? Nowadays, but in that, you know, about 100 years ago, it's a difficult task. Targeted organic synthesis is very difficult. Okay, from Suberone. From Suberone. Took 17 minutes. Actually, I uh, my notes, I didn't give the details of it, but you know, for those who are interested, I had given all the 17 steps that are involved. Would you like to synthesize something like this nowadays? No way. You will run away from organic synthesis. <clears throat> But in those days, you know, of course, there's no spectroscopy. You need to characterize chemically every time, making a derivative. It's very difficult. Um, I'm sure you know the work of uh, uh, Robert Woodward, uh, cholesterol synthesis, especially, that involves 35 steps. 35 steps. Four plus, you know, jacks, and you see, it's not, it's not done by, it's not done by one. One student or one postdoc. That also, you know, his total synthesis involves a lot of postdocs and graduate students, you know, 10 to 15. You now, when they finish, they hand over, you know, for two milligrams or 10 milligrams, and then the other postdoc will take 10 milligrams and do another 20 uh, step synthesis to achieve whatever. So it's going to be a, a tricky one, especially if you work in, um, you know, Woodward's lab in those days. But, uh, you know, having said all these things, I think now he's not here. Yeah. So, um, Robert Robinson synthesized this particular compound in a single step. What took about 17 steps by um, his name is Bill Satter. Um he has done in single step. How is it possible? How is it possible? He used 
retrosynthetic approach. If you are an organic compound, you know about retrosynthetic approach. So uh, what he did, he um, uh, you know uh, he just broke you know break these bonds and then make it into small derivatives, and then he combined this one, and then he was able to prepare this compound in a single step. Okay, this is called retrosynthetic approach. Nowadays, this is what you guys do if you want to have a target molecule. You just uh, you know uh, make them into small pieces. And then how you can combine them using different derivatives and different, you know, single stuff, and you get it. So this is what he achieved. It, it was a masterpiece about 100 years ago. It was a masterpiece, but not anymore. Yeah. Okay, now, why I'm talking about it? I'm coming to this point. I'm going to introduce supramolecular synthon, okay? So I'm going to introduce synthon by E.J. Corey, Elias Corey. So what he did was, you know, the small substructural unit that you cut into small pieces, you know, to combine them, that's the, that's the one he mastered and he called it synthon. And this is, synthon is a small but representative of the target molecule. So he used, for example, these two are, these two are the uh, synthons to make this compound. So it contains, you know, I mean, the combination. He, he knows how to how to break down into this into small molecules and then combine them back to this. So these are all called synthons according to him. So this is organic synthons. People know that. Even first year students will know about it. Um, so why I'm talking about it? I'm going to introduce supramolecular synthon. That's why you have to know first of all what is meant by synthon. For that you have to know retrosynthesis, and then that's what. Because I'm going to introduce supramolecular synthon, you want to know what is my supramolecule. So I have to introduce what is my supramolecule. And not only that, the supramolecular chemistry is highly related, closely related to crystal engineering, as I mentioned before. <clears throat> so let me introduce Humphrey Davy isolated crystal uh, of chlorine hydrate. Chlorine is trapped inside the hydrate. It's the first time it's uh, something new inside is very stable at room temperature. You know, you can take it out and when you heat it up, it goes. But, you know, Humphrey Davy was the first one. This is clather, it's supposed to be a kind of uh, engineering kind of thing. Emil Fisher, you know, he's got lock and key principles. And then he explained, the, you know, the enzymes and how it, uh, how it works and everything. He has got supramolecular thinking, you know, the, the right, right size and shape, and that fits in into lock and key kind of concept. And then Powell is the one hydroquinone in terms of network structures I mentioned to you. And then later, uh, Jean Marie Lane, the supramolecules are two molecules, so like, like molecules. Uh, similar one, you know, if you have aggregates, you know, uh, due to um, deep interactions, you call it supramolecules, but he called it supramolecules. <clears throat> and the intermolecular bond, what molecules are to atoms are to covalent bond. So for for molecules, you have covalent bond. For supramolecule, you have supramolecular interaction, non-covalent interaction. So that's a similarity. <clears throat> then I, I, I mentioned to you before about Dune and Dunnix, Jack Dunnix, and the organic crystals are supramolecules for excellence. Okay, so they're all supramolecules. They're all, you know, crystals are nothing but supramolecules, according to him. Um, this is nothing but, you know, so you know the difference between supramolecules Molecule and a supramolecule because supra means weak interactions you know, uh, that are present. Yeah. Okay. Now <clears throat> it's a sidetrack, nothing to do with crystal engineering. But anyway, because supramolecular chemistry, you know, three people won the award before. That is uh, uh, Donald Cram, Jo Mary Lane, and uh, Patterson. You know, these two guys, this is, he is in UCLA, I think, Professor Joe Mary Lane, everybody knows he visited here in India several times from France. There's a one, one more guy, Charles Patterson. I don't know how many of you know him. So because of their work on krypton and, uh, you know, crown eaters, they won the Nobel Prize. I'm going to talk about my favorite. What is the problem? You help me. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, it's good. You can fill the whole thing. Anyway. I'm going to talk about Charles Patterson. Charles Patterson was born in Poussin, Korea. Uh, again, he's a, you know, his uh, parents were Norwegian, Japanese mother, and he went to uh, US for studies in 1922, studied in chemical engineering, University of Dayton, master's in organic chemistry, master's, no PhD. One of the few to win Nobel Prize without PhD. Okay. <clears throat> And also, he worked in DuPont for 42 years from 1927. He's got 25 papers, 65 patents. 25 patents, uh, 25 papers. And of those, he published two papers on crown ethers. One, he published a single author paper in JANGS, won him Nobel Prize. He published only one paper relevant to his. Nobel Prize. Okay, that got him. And the second paper, organic, you know, he got him in 1988, but he died in 1987. So after, after, no, 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 1989, sorry, 1988. Uh, you know, the year he got Nobel Prize, next year he was asked to write a, write a review or whatever because he won the Nobel Prize. You know, where did he write? Organic synthesis, synthesis collection, not even to nature, no science. He wrote to some obscure journals, only two papers. And that's about it. Okay, so if you want to big Nobel Prize, you don't have to publish a lot of papers. You don't have to publish in nature and science. So that's uh, what I want to emphasize. It's uh, quality. Of course, you know, 2016 for the molecular emissions. Maybe next week when I'm talk, going to talk about um, the research lecture, I'm going to touch upon this. So, supramolecular chemistry. I, I I'm going to show you the uh, how supramolecular chemistry is related to molecular chemistry. It's a chemistry beyond molecule. That's supramolecular chemistry. I mean, in in molecular chemistry, you talk about atom. In supramolecular chemistry, you talk about molecule. This is covalent bond in molecular chemistry. Intermolecular bond, supramolecular bond in supramolecular chemistry or crystal engineering for that matter. Okay. You say synthesis, you say crystal engineering. Say synthon, supramolecular. I'm going to introduce supramolecular synthon. Isomer, so polymorph. In organic, you have isomer. In this case, you have polymorph. Transition state, nucleus. Okay. Reaction. Crystallization. Okay, you see the relationship between you know molecular chemistry and supramolecular chemistry. If we start exactly on okay, maybe maybe next one I will just finish. Okay, this is the one. So I want to introduce supramolecular synthon, uh, which is an very important concept in organic organic crystal engineering. What is meant by supramolecular synthon? It was introduced um, by Desi in his famous 1995 review. This is nothing but a, a pattern that is composed of molecule, molecular, and supramolecular elements. It's nothing but a type of pattern made up of supramolecular interactions. Okay. Usually, this will repeat several times. When it when it is repeated several times in the crystal structures, it's called supramolecular synthon. Not just, you know, once I, I saw that, then can you can I call it supramolecular synthon? It should appear regularly. So synthon consists of a few functional groups held together by strong and directional interactions. Okay. With that, let me start today. I'm going to talk about this supramolecular, you know, the synthon as well as tectons. You know, I'm going to introduce what's meant by tecton. When you combine these two, you get a crystal, organic crystal, molecular crystal. Okay? That's what I'm going to talk about it. I will continue my lecture tomorrow.